warm welcome to the podcast series of Societeit Fastfood International. My name is Ron van Roys and I'm business partner at the Societeit and chair of the Societeit Fastfood International expert team. Societeit Fastfood is a leading Dutch real estate foundation with over 800 C-level executives covering all asset classes and it's active in the Netherlands but also does cross-border business in European markets and it's rapidly expanding in global geographies. Societeit Fastfood International empowers members to explore new markets, share thought leadership, build up trustful relations and make impact together. My first guest in the show is Javier Gutierrez, business owner at Capacity, part of the leading IT company Segeka. Javier, welcome. Welcome. Good morning. How are you, Ron? Yeah, all good. Uh, really interesting to do a deep dive in, let's say, smart city industry. So let's start with your, let's say, a little bit of your background and your purpose. Of course. Um, well, my, my background is actually on economics and political science. Uh, when I started my career, I was always very interested in the aspects of urban policy. So, um, yeah, I started first working in consultancy where um, I got very quickly connected with the topics of technology. And uh, later in my career, I decided to do a concentration on smart cities, which is really the perfect merge between economics, political science, and also technology in the, in the implementation of urban policy. Yeah, interesting. Well, uh, also regarding your company, eh? um, let's say Segeka and also uh, Capacity, um, the one-liner of Segeka is in close cooperation. Could you briefly explain the meaning? Yes, of course. Um, well, even though Segeka is already active for more than 30 years in, in Belgium and in other countries, mm -hmm. um, it's um, and it's pretty much in the background of a lot of different solutions, uh, such as in healthcare, um, in other areas of technology. Um, uh, Seheka is a family-owned company, which um, has a very specific uh, work culture, where we really like to be a partner for our customers. We really like to take them by the hand, really provide them uh, close advice, um, and be just one with them uh, in their journeys as they transform, as they digitalize, as they implement new, new solutions. Yeah, founding uh, your uh, company capacity. Can you? How did it evolve towards this, uh, let's say, platform? Yes, of course. Um, well, um, we have been for many years involved in many different industries and segments. Um, and among one of our top customers, uh, we have Q Park, which is one of the leading commercial parking operators across Europe. Um, and around 15 years ago, they came to, to us at Seheka to help them in the development of um, agnostic parking as a smart service platform that will help them digitalize their, their different parking locations. But uh, most importantly, they wanted to develop a, an actual ecosystem of complementary services. They wanted to connect all their parking locations to, for example, a reservation portal to develop um, uh, an app. Uh, to connect to other parties uh, that are like resellers or booking systems. So uh, from that journey, we, we actually got to understand and know very well what is the parking industry. And uh, well, we said we can actually take this know-how and uh, actually help cities in their intention to uh, solve the different mobility problems that they encounter. Um, many people don't, don't think too much about it, but um, mobility is more than just providing sustainable means of transport. It's not just enabling some bikes and others. The mm -hmm. actual backbone of that is the uh, resolution of of, um, of the parking uh, because you want to convince the different users to leave their cars, which is the most comfort comfortable mean of transport, and uh, try this other type of, uh, of, of transportation systems. So to do that, you need to have... Um, a smart parking system around the cities that is able to convince uh, people to have a seamless experience and to transition to to that those types of transport. And like that, uh, with capacity, we, we thought that we could create a product that would help cities generate or create mobility hubs around the cities mm -hmm. so that it would gravitate the cars there. People would leave their cars and complete their last mile in more sustainable means of transport or public transport or, or other methods. Yeah, that's also one of the, let's say, goals for regarding this podcast series to, um, well, do a little bit of a deep dive in topics or new markets uh, or, let's say, innovations 
where also real estate parties are not fully aware of, and also in terms of the added value. So uh, you're already highlighting, let's say, the, the sustainability target, uh, that we're cr creating resilient cities, where also mobility has a different meaning or maybe place in area development. Can you elaborate when also, for example, you're working with real estate investors, what kind of conversation and also where is the win-win solution between the asset owner and your company? Uh, it's a good question also. Um, so when you see really the, the problem, you cannot think about it just as, as one party system. You have to see everything that goes around it. And uh, within the concept of urban, urban policy, actually real estate and off-street um, locations have a, a very important role to play. Uh, cities can uh, accommodate and try to adapt certain uh, systems of transport. Um, and for that, there's a lot of uh, different initiatives. But if you do not, do not have the participation of the private sector uh, enabling uh, any type of asset that they have, uh, for example, their, their parking locations, uh, that which are off street or maybe the EV chargers in which they invest, then, um, uh, well, you, you have an issue. You cannot really uh, completely resolve the problem within the cities. So what you see is there's a lot of push and regulation uh, towards involving the private sector uh, as part of the solution. Uh, they are being requested, for example, to enabling um, some type of semi-public usage of their parking assets, um, or they are uh, being, for example, requested to do a transformation of, of their of their buildings to accommodate uh, X percentage of, of EV chargers. Um, and that's why it's very important that you really keep that, that synergy and that uh, good communication between both the public and the private sector to collaborate and, and resolve the the mobility issue as a whole. Yeah, and, and of course, uh, I think it also matches uh, ESG requirements. Eh? When I look at the, the CSRD legislation and also where uh, being compliant, but also having the ability to report, how are you contributing to this objective to report on, let's say, the E of uh, ESG, eh? the environmental side, but also from a governance point of view that you are able to uh, report via data? That's exactly right. Um, and, and I would say it's actually one of the, the three true differentiators between what is an access control system and what is a, an actual smart parking system. Access control, uh, like it's in the traditional parking model that everybody knows, is just based on having some type of recognition at entry. So you have a, a badge or you have a QR code or license plate recognition, which is, let's say, the, the most advanced and seamless experience. And then you have a driver uh, pool of, of people that can just enter and exit. But that's very basic. Uh, smart parking takes that to a, a different level. You, you actually need to have very precise and accurate data so that you really understand what are the different uh, levels of, of usage and occupancy of all these different type of, of, of entities, of parties, of companies, uh, drivers that come to those locations. Um, and then thanks to that uh, information and data, you are then able to uh, know more accurately, okay, what is the expected occupancy or the forecasting of, of occupancy within different types of the day? Um, you are then able also to start having historical records of what is the actual average demand of space within those buildings, which therefore then uh, starts giving you very strong arguments towards the, the public sector on uh, what is the amount of necessary um, the spots to build. Uh, what we see, for example, in, in, in our company is that... Uh, uh, when when you take all the complex uh, multi-tenant office building campuses and others, the average occupancy of, of parking lots is about 64%. It means that we are actually overbuilding um, the amount of necessary parking spaces. Uh, so imagine that you had all the right data and you can show that uh, very clearly to the governments and, and then um, uh, convince them that you don't need to build such big uh, parking lots. You can do them much smaller and use them much more efficiently. That has a very significant reduction in the carbon footprint of, of building those locations, yeah. besides talking about the economical benefits for, for the real estate developers and others. So so that's why um, uh, having a platform is very important. You, you really need to be able to capture all that information, to keep it, and, and to be uh, able to make data-driven decisions. And is, are indeed policymakers already embracing this? Like Because uh, when you're having proof, when also, for example, when a developer is sharing, well, this is data, maybe I need this amount of parking spaces, but when you have a unbiased data set, are policymakers already, let's say, taking this into account in terms of their policymaking drives regarding mobility, 
in creating smart cities or am I a little bit too over enthusiastic? Uh, uh, well, I, I would say that we're in still in a very early phase. Um, certainly governments are, are understanding how important data is and they do try to capture as many data points as they can, especially for, for, from where they do have an influence. So a lot of external sensors, for uh, example, for traffic congestion, uh, for the usage of other uh, methods like uh, bike counters and others, mm -hmm. um, but not so much within the, the private space. Uh, for that, uh, there hasn't been too many advanced uh, solutions that are capturing that data accurately uh, and also take into account very other important factors like GDPR and others, right? You want to anonymize this data, you want to have it in a structured format. So from my perspective, we are in a very early stage in order to to, to do that. However, what's going to happen and, and regulation is, is moving towards that is to uh, precisely start uh, requesting this information from the for the private entities. Hence also the push on, on regulation that you're mentioning uh, also for the real estate sector. So, so yeah, there's a solution like ours that are already starting to gather that information, the structuring, keep it on, on, on long historical periods. Um, and I believe it's going to take oh, still a couple of, of years until we really start taking that information and taking into account in, in urban regulation. Yeah, very interesting. And I'm also uh, aware that, uh, or maybe curious, uh, because when you look at your Partnerships. Are you partnering with, let's say, asset owners and developers, or, or are you more and more involved in, let's say, city and area developments where you have, let's say, PPP partnerships where you are part of the, let's say, uh, decision making process? Can you, and also maybe elaborate with some success stories on that one? Of course. Um, well, we, we actually started first with a focus towards the governments. That's why we created a smart cities division within Seheka. Uh, we re really wanted to address those challenges and directly talk to the governments. Um, in, in general, the, the experience has been successful. Um, but as it happens a lot with governments, it's a slow process. There, there's a lot of um, uh, discussions and, and process involved, which makes the, the, the timelines uh, longer. And by the way, I'm not only talking about the, the capacity solution for which I'm responsible uh, uh, for. There's other solutions within Seheka, like Citizen AI and, and other products that are really catered and specific for the, the public sector. Um, so uh, because of that, we uh, also shifted towards talk directly with the private sector, directly with the real estate developers and the property owners. Um, and in there, of course, we see that, that speeds are much quicker uh, and, and we come with an, a specific value proposition for them. But uh, all in all, I would say that we are moving in the two fronts. Um, on, on the private sector, we're really partnering with big real estate developers, especially the ones that are multi-hop, so that have multiple properties spread either across the country, across Europe, uh, or even worldwide. I think we also have the potential, even though we're not there yet. Um, and, and also with the governments, uh, for example, implementing with, with some European uh, funds and grants, uh, the concept of the mobility hubs that I was explaining you at the beginning, uh, right? So having a, a platform like ours, implement and, and run the operations of mobility hubs around the cities. We're doing a project now with the municipality of Hasselt to, to do that and in, in coordination with other uh, mobility partners for shared mobility, for micro mobility and others. Um, and then we're, we're pretty much creating a pilot there that uh, we want to prove it's going to be successful. And then you can take that very same technology and, and, and format and then take it to any other uh, Flemish city or even uh, any other city worldwide. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and to give you a bit of, of an example, so so yeah, that's the example from the public sector. On the private sector, we have more like real estate developers, like, uh, for example, NSE in the Netherlands. Um, they have uh, a lot of office buildings uh, across Amsterdam and, and other cities in, in the Netherlands. What we've done is we've partnered with them and with our platform, we are helping them more to capture very accurate data and to distribute the, the weight of parking and, and EV charging usage across their different offices, redirecting their, their different um, users because they also have co-working space and, and other type of, 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 of use cases towards the, the locations that need it the most. And yeah. like that, we, we, we help them have a, a more accurate view of, of what are really their requirements in terms of space usage at their locations. Yeah, it sounds very interesting. And, and regarding the, those uh, best practices, when you also, let's say, make it smart, huh? and when you look at the added value, both on the revenue streams, but also on... Uh, minimizing your carbon footprint or optimizing uh, the, the the occupancy rate. Can you give some examples and also, let's say, hard data regarding your impact? Well, um, well um, I, I think the, the most significant um, and 
unstoppable um, uh, return that you see from, from a platform uh, like ours when we implement uh, those locations is really fixing the, the complexity on the operations and the amount of energy and, and resources wasted to, to coordinate that. Uh, what's happening a lot in the industry is that there's a transition between a single tenant, single purpose um, environments. Uh, like in, in the past, we used to have always like one company with all their employees working at one building. So it was a very simple uh, thing to manage to this transition towards multi-tenant, multi-purpose uh, um, uh, locations, right? When that happens and you have an A-class office with a um, co-working space, a gym and a restaurant all sharing the same assets, then the operations might become very complex. And with that comes a lot of hassle. It comes uh, the issues that people get stuck at the entrance, that there's not enough space for anybody to park. So they're just rumbling around the building or creating traffic congestion and, and other um, uh, problems within the, their neighborhoods uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, when we apply our smart technology, we remove that hassle from, from, from their hands. Um, things just room seamless. People have automatic entry. They know for sure that there's going to be an available parking spot in advance because they have either reserved it or the system will maximize the probability that they find such, such, um, some such spots. Um, and like that, you then are already optimizing the way that the parking is, is, is utilized. Um, other aspects in which data is, is relevant, um, we developed this functionality called dynamic capacity, where our system has a very clear understanding of what is the historical occupancy and forecast of usage of different companies within a building. So let's say that one of those companies suddenly needs 50 spaces more because they have an event. Well, uh, what the platform does automatically is it, it checks how, what is going to be the expected occupancy of all the other tenants and then works as a space broker saying, okay, I can take two or three parking spots from this company, these two or three from this other. And like that, space is just used more, more flexibly. Um, and also, well, it generates its own uh, revenue streams because you can commercialize that space within the tenants and that generates more revenue for the owners of those buildings. Um, so that proves you what technology can do in terms of, of real optimization of yeah. automation and on cost reductions on the operations of those locations. But can you also put some numbers on it? Like for example, also the carbon footprint, eh, which is a, I think a very important goal regarding uh, being Paris proof. Well, well, with the carbon footprint, it's a little bit more complicated because that's something external to the operations of the, of the facility, mm -hmm. which is really what we're, what we're aiming for. Uh, but what, we can uh, do tell is that, uh, of course, if we are able to digitalize the operations of those locations and you are able to share that information openly to, for example, third party resellers like a Park B or an EC Park, um, yeah. and also with the central database of the, of the municipality, you can um, inform that and, and have an informed driver that knows in advance that when they're going to go there, they're going to be very certain that they're going to find a parking spot or an EV spot. Um, like that, you, you do have um, a, a important reductions on congestion, on pollution within the inner cities and, and others. Um, now, tangible numbers is, is hard to tell you, of course, um, but yeah. we do have some examples. There's this other product of ours, like CTS and AI, where we are able to uh, actually check with real data, with TomTom data and other items, what is the traffic congestion on cities and, and and actually the, the citizen AI is able to, to capture this information. Um, now, so that's externally. Um, internally, as I tell you, it's more about uh, the efficiency and, and, and how much of that space is really um, kept to the, to the maximum um, and how much um, is the, is the um, how to say, the usage of more sustainable means of transport like the EV chargers and others. That's where you really see the, the, the impact on the carbon footprint. Yeah, very interesting, uh, Javier, also because I think when you look at uh, the CSRD and also the, the value chain approach, it's becoming less or it's becoming a holistic way of measuring sustainability. Yeah? So it's it's very interesting to also involve mobility in the total real estate environment because it's not solely your asset. Eh? It has to do with the behavior of your customer, behavior of your occupier. Uh, but also your partners. So being compliant is also about uh, the, the value chain approach. And I think your solution or your platform way of thinking and acting connects the dots. Am I correct with this uh, hypothesis? 
That's correct. Uh, what we try is to indeed uh, be a, a connector, an integrator of all these different types of uh, services that yeah. are um, within the building, but also outside the building in order to contribute to the, the whole ecosystem of, of mobility and, 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 yeah, and electromobility actually uh, across the city and the, the private sector. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and also a uh, part of a of a podcast is always uh, that we we are driven to know more also about future plans. So when we speak, when we will speak with you in five years, where is your capacity? Which geographies, and also what's next on your uh, own roadmap? So as you might have heard, there's a very important keyword in the industry now, which is artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. That's really uh, something where we see um, there's a, a very high potential and impact that can be done. Uh, from our side in, in capacity, we already have a lot of uh, smart technology, uh, as I say, for all aspects of uh, optimization of usage of space. However, uh, the integration of generative AI within our solution is something that, that we can still work on uh, to take that to a, a, an even higher le level. So to give you an example, um, you can not only dynamically use the space across um, the different types of tenants and users in, in, a, in a parking facility, uh, but you can also use it, for example, for um, uh, different EV charging behaviors, right? Uh, you can say, okay, um, this specific driver, I know it's a sales colleague, and uh, he will uh, actually need to be on the road at 11 because he's going to have to go visit some customers. While I have another um, colleague who is a developer who's going to be until 5 or 6 in the afternoon. Um, and uh, he doesn't need the energy to uh, be sent to his car right away. So thanks to artificial intelligence, you can take all these different uh, data points. Uh, you can take even uh, into account external factors like is there going to be a lot of sunlight and others. And uh, using a, an AI algorithm, you can then redistribute the energy in the most effective way, also taking into account, by the way, uh, the, the pricing tariffs of the energy, the, the, the congestion tariffs and others, in order to do that uh, very efficiently and dynamically and automatically. Uh, for that, we, we already have um, a collaboration with Phoenix Contact and their solution with, with Mint, but we are still, let's say, in the, in the early stages. Uh, we're taking that even further, uh, already implementing it in, in various locations. Uh, the very same can be done with dynamic pricing. That's also important uh, so that we accommodate when there's very high demands, then you can have a very high uh, 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 um, pricing so that you dis disincentivize people to come with the car uh, to certain areas of the, of, the, of the city where you also have a, a capacity location. And at the same time, uh, on the contrary, incentivize uh, bringing people uh, to certain locations, to certain areas of the city so that you disperse the traffic as, as best as you can. Um, the last one also that now it's I see it a lot in the industry is that they are trying to implement AI chatbots for every aspect of service. So let's say that you arrive at the barrier and uh, mm -hmm. usually you would have to press an intercom and, and have a, a receptionist talk to you. Well, you can have a, a, an LLM to actually do that automatically and, and the LLM will be taking into account all the different uh, information of, of, of and the context of the operation, even the historical information of, of parking occupancy of that person in order to provide fully full guidance and to have the, the system completely automated. Um, so we're working on those technologies. Now, where do we want to be in, in five years? We we are now present in five countries. So we're in Belgium, the Netherlands, uh, Luxembourg, Germany, and Romania, where uh, SEHECA has had a, a, a strong presence and where uh, there's really um, a drive for innovation. But we are absolutely certain that this product is, is not only a, a disruptor and an, an innovator in the market, but it has the potential to go global. So we certainly expect to keep on growing within the European markets and really have a full European footprint by, by then. Um, and we're also already thinking, uh, let's say, jumping to, to other continents. Um, SECA has just done an acquisition of CTG in the United States. Uh, they also have, uh, we also have offices in, in Latin America and in India. So I think those are also uh, potential geographies for our solution. Yeah, very interesting. Also, when because to my opinion, it's really becoming an interconnected world and that also real estate has a different meaning and also position in the value chain or let's say for example real estate investors asset owners do they think this is still a nice to have or are they already transitioning towards well this it data smart city is really a must have where, where are we right now and let's say be also a little bit 
uh, realistic about real estate. You can also nudge them into the right direction. So what's your answer? Uh, so uh, we started these conversations um, about two years ago. Uh, capacity actually started uh, in 2019. Then mm -hmm. we got, uh, let's say, affected by the well, affected by the pandemic, which it was not exactly the case for us. Mm -hmm. It allowed us actually to to really focus on the development of the platform, and to I would say leapfrog uh, any existing uh, parking systems of of the day. Um, and when we were finally open again, and we we uh, confronted the market with what we had developed, which is uh, really advanced. We did receive a lot this uh, reply of like, this is great. This is really future proof and this is uh, an, a, a great solution. But um, I, we don't think we need it for now. It's, it's, it's too much for us. It's just a want, as you say. Mm -hmm. uh, so we said, okay, um, uh, you'll see in a couple of years that uh, what will be the situation. And indeed, as we have seen th throughout the last uh, two years, there's a very big push in the in the in the B2B segments on on real estate, specifically on office buildings, right? Where mm -hmm. a lot of people are now uh, doing hybrid work, so uh, a lot of these offices are now empty, um, and they are actually being pushed to transform themselves into becoming multi-purpose office buildings because that's really where the future is, yeah. uh, which then make them more complex. And when they become complex, the existing solutions are not a good fit. Uh, they require a system like ours in order to manage that complexity. And that's really important also because it, it's only by transforming to these multi-purpose environments that they can retain the value of those properties and really be attractive for A-class tenants, right? So the big Deloitte's and PwCs, mm -hmm. they want to work in these locations with the greatest technology so what we're seeing now, uh, especially throughout the, the last year, is that there's an inflow now of, of those customers that in the past were saying, uh, yeah, it's too much. Now they're like, okay, we, we actually need you. We, we need you because of the EV charging complexity. We need you because of the uh, of the parking and operational complexity. Um, and, and because also they see the potential uh, on the different revenue streams that can be generated. Uh, so now we are in that process of taking them by the hand, helping them in their digitalization journey, and, and for them to try their, their first, let's say, we always tell them, give us your, your most difficult location and, and you'll see how we'll fix it. And some of them have already seen that and they've seen how good it works. So then they're saying, okay, we want it for the next seven or eight buildings or these existing ones, while others are just in the first building as we're implementing them. So, so I think it's, it's really picking up. Um, and, um, and yeah, it's, it's the way that, that is progressing now. Yeah, interesting uh, evolution uh, in the, regarding them um, going a little bit in the final stage in the in this podcast. When you when you have a little bit of reflection to the real estate environment, and also when you take this development into account, how will it evolve? Also, let's say the real estate profession will it take different skill sets from real estate professionals to collaborate or to integrate or to create a different, say, decision-making process? What's your take on that one? Well, my perception is that the, the real estate sector is um, a great sector to work on, um, but it's still in many aspects very traditional. Uh, it, I would say it's one of their last traditional segments. However, uh, the conditions of the market and uh, the macroeconomy and also the evolution of technology is really pushing them to, to start opening themselves and, and to digitalize and to integrate uh, new solutions like ours and to be informed about it. Right, uh, it, it, you cannot. I mean, besides the concept of, of ESG and 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 how relevant it is in the industry now, the second most important topic, if you see any of the existing reports, is artificial intelligence. How am I going to integrate technology into my properties? Uh, because it's not only about the bricks and mortar anymore. Now you have a digital layer on top of those properties that that actually um, creates additional value for for those locations. So, I see the real estate developer um, broadening a little bit more their their horizon and their perspective to understand what are the existing technologies, to think about their, their buildings as an, as an ecosystem uh, that connects to other areas and, and other systems inside, but also outside the building in coordination with cities um, in order to, to, to really uh, be competitive and, and to really have, let's say, uh, outstanding A-class type of properties that are going to be the ones that are uh, going to be most valuable in the future. Well, regarding value, and that's, of course, a lot of our members are investors. Does it also reflect already the valuation? Because that's the interesting part, eh? well, because we see a little bit of a transition from valuation of an asset, let's say the Propco side, but Opco is getting more and more important, eh? also with mixed-use buildings. Do you already see with real numbers that 
it has an impact on future valuations of assets or will that be the next step? Um, well, there's certainly existing data on how is this A-class type of locations, the ones that are, are really in high in demand. If you see any other type of property that is not A-class, they are actually diminishing uh, for multiple uh, reasons. Um, and what defines those A-class offices, besides the, the aspects of integration of, uh, of ESG components and, and the different types of solutions around that and the way that you build that and, and, and what type of context you build, the other very relevant uh, point is the integration of technology. Uh, it's about providing these seamless, uh, wonderful user experiences that uh, will actually attract employees to go and, and work there, to be there present. Uh, it's the, the ones that the big companies want to actually lease and, and rent. So, so I, I think that uh, it's already being incorporated, integrated. Uh, we have to see then how this continues to evolve as um, uh, the different systems in a building start to connect and integrate more with each other. And as these new types of experiences are, are also integrated into the services of those buildings, they really become smart and, and, and yeah, you have both, uh, multiple systems talking to each other. Yeah, great. Well, Javier, my final question, and it's actually related to our young professional, because I think uh, a lot of young professionals are uh, very keen to listen to podcasts, whether they drive in the car or in the train to the office or working at home. Yeah, that's also, of course, uh, uh, the, 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 I think very relevant. When you have would give one advice to future professionals, and let's say people just come, coming from the university, uh, entering the real estate market, what's your advice in terms of their focus, their core business, their, um, well, let's say purpose? What's your key takeaway for this group of people? Um, well, what I've especially uh, put a lot of emphasis on lately on, on a personal level, but I also see it in everybody who's working around me, the, the different partners and companies that we work with, is that this is a, the world of, of the hyper change. Everything is is moving at such a quick pace, at such a quick speed. And I'm not only talking about technology, it's just all the different changes in terms of, of politics, of disruption, of everything that that, that, that surrounds us is, is moving on at, at a very accelerated pace, which means that probably that everything that you have learned even throughout your university or that you have learned in the last five years might very quickly become obsolete because there's a, a, new, uh, a new thing coming. Um, so my advice would be that um, more importantly than learning a discipline or, or specializing and focusing on, on one item, which can be useful, is that you learn how to learn. You have to continuously keep yourself um, uh, updated with what's the latest information, what's the latest technology, um, and, and you have to basically be uh, readapting and transforming yourself in order to accommodate that world of hyper change. Uh, so, so, so that would be the, the most relevant <laughs> advice I can give you, um, uh, for example, in my personal case, um, I had talked about uh, technologies like blockchain and artificial intelligence already from more than five years back when, when I was in, in, in other fields and, and, and companies. Uh, but uh, even now, nowadays, it's, I'm, I'm already feeling I'm staying behind. I need to continuously be doing courses, reading new things. And also, by the way, uh, uh, having good discussions with great colleagues in the field that are really experts on, on the subject and that can always nurture you and, and, and build your your expertise and know-how. Well, as an associate professor, I love this statement, Javier. So a lifelong learning for everybody. And I, I really, uh, I'm impressed by the, your interconnected vision. So thank you very much for your thought leadership. I think it was very insightful and hopefully we can connect the dots uh, even in all geographies. So where also we're trying to merge your AI, IT with real estate creating a valuable business case for a future. So thanks very much for your insights.